So thank you for listening to the Mental Insights Podcast. This is your host, Brennan Catulli, and we are here today for episode number 35 with Nadia Raymond. Nadia, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure, and I can't wait to start this conversation about such an important topic within mental health. So thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm really excited, I guess, to explore and discuss this with you. I'm so happy to hear that. And to start off, I think it's a great ability to, you know, encompass how mental health is so important to yourself and society. So really, when did you become passionate and aware about mental health and its importance within not only yourself, but society today? Yeah, well, for me, I think it really um, started off, I think it started off when I was studying psychology in school. Um, but then I became more aware of mental health issues within my own family. Um, and then from that, I guess it kind of gave me a bit of a, I guess a bit of a doorway to kind of learn a bit more about okay, what's, what's going on. So basically my, um, my grandfather was schizophrenic. And I didn't have any idea about mental health at that time. So this was going back a little while, like when I was about um, 15, 16, and I started to study psychology and I started to become a bit more aware of, of mental health. Um, but there was a lot of silence around. There was a lot of confusion for myself because nobody was talking about it. I didn't really know what it was. And he was, he was sectioned a few times. Obviously, his behavior was... Um, kind of dis distorted so he would forget where he was or he would think he was in another country he would forget who we were like who his family was um and i guess as i learned a little bit more about psychology and about mental health um my passion came from wanting to move out of patterns like move from dysfunctional patterns um and to learn a bit more okay what what can what can trigger mental health issues um how, how do people experience them, but how, how can we move through them as well and not, not become sort of stuck in them and not, not repeat them. Um, so when I started learning about humanistic psychology, I had a lot of time to delve into the self and learning about the self, learning about the ego and how, how the mind works. Um, so I guess that for me was probably where where my passion, my curiosity started. And then the more I studied, the more interested I became in it. And now that's kind of, that's the field that I'm working in now. It, it's definitely a, a great piece of awareness when you see someone tangibly in front of you struggling and, and facing one of these challenges, you know, especially then once you start to learn about some of the signs and symptoms, some, some of the behavioral patterns as someone is, is facing one of these issues. You know, when you were starting to learn and, and understand more about the, the field, you know, what were some of the, you know, noticeable, uh, you know, patterns and some of the, you know, signs and symptoms that you became aware of through, you know, someone who was experiencing, whether it was schizophrenia or it could have been any other mental health challenge, you know, how do, how were you able to become more aware of how prominent of you know an issue mental health was? Um, I think that for me was, I guess I learned. Again, it was like through kind of personal learning, really, um, where I became aware of actually like kind of even smaller. I don't really want to call them like dysfunctional behaviors because it's. The kind of like emotions that everybody has so things like anger and um sadness and but then you have them on a kind of continuum so there's there's sadness that we might experience when when something happens or something hasn't really gone our way but then there's sadness and anger that we might experience that is quite intense and quite and quite severe and i started to notice i, I started to become a lot more aware of that um in in the people around me but then also within myself. And I think this is something I'll probably come on to talk about in a little while, but um, I started to notice, I guess, when, that, when those emotions, um, they move on that continuum, on that spectrum. And like, so you have a kind of a quote unquote normal range of functioning, 
and then there are people that are either to one extreme or the other where um quite depressed or quite anxious or in the kind of extremes of emotions um i don't think i can really pinpoint an exact moment or an exact time when i became more more aware of the patterns i think it's something that's kind of happened gradually over the years um and now it's something i can't really switch off <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. You know, as, as you start to, you know, gain and become more educated within the field, you definitely, you know, you can see patterns more effectively in a lot of these behavioral responses and yeah. specifically within yourself, you know, how, how did you, you know, transition to understanding more about your own experiences within mental health, you know, before you were studying and becoming educated and then transitioning into learning more about psychology and understanding, you know, how emotions play into the, you know, characterizations of our own mental health. Mm. Yeah, I guess for me, with my own experiences, so my, because my study was mainly in psychology in terms of like, like the different disciplines, so developmental psychology, health psychology, um, and then a lot of it of counseling. So back then, there wasn't that much of an emphasis on mental health. It was more like other types of um, other things that you can study and learn about regarding psychology. So whether that's kind of animal behavior or whether that's advertising and, and like societal attitudes and things like that. And I think the mental health side of things came in my studies a lot later. So this was after, um, after even my own experiences of like mental health issues. Um, because even at that point, when I was struggling with my own stuff, I was studying psychology, but I still didn't know anything about mental health and I didn't know what was going on for me. Um, so that came, that came quite after. And I think at that point then I was, I was in a space where, where I could understand it better. Um, like I was more removed from my own experience of, of depression that I could then look back and make sense of like, Oh, okay, this is actually what happened. And like, I could see that what I was experiencing back then. So this was about 10 years ago now. Um, like ticks all the boxes of depression, but at that time I didn't know it was that. If that, I don't know if that answers your question. I might have gone off. Yeah, a bit. yeah, yeah, no, it does. And in in terms of you know your own experiences, how how was your own interpretation of you know any type of education or resources out there? You know, speak about you know as you were transitioning through you know these challenges that you faced. Did you feel like there was support with within your community or within, you know, your, your social circle or, you know, how, how has that transitioned from now that you've become educated and now that you can support others? Yeah, that's a really good question actually, because it was, it was very difficult. And I would say like, if I was experiencing kind of similar difficulty as I was back then, even now, like I, I wouldn't, I don't think I would really know where to, where to go or, or what to do if I hadn't if I hadn't done the training that I've done. Um, so obviously as, as a psychologist myself, I have, all, I have the tools that I need. Um, but then I guess because of, I guess maybe yeah, I, should, I should mention that I'm Muslim and, and I'm Pakistani and within our community, I'm sure like within a lot of other communities as well, there is a lot of stigma um, and there are not many resources available, particularly like for certain groups. Um, to access mental health services or to learn about what mental health is. Um, so for me, there was a lot of, I guess, silence around. There was a lot of, okay, I, I don't know what I'm experiencing or feeling. I don't know how to make sense of this and I don't know who to talk to either. Um, so I guess now the things that I've learned, I can still see that there is a lot of stigma around because that a lot of people that I talk to will mention things that they're struggling with. Um, also from a similar community as me, um, but then them also not knowing where to go or what to do, or um, I guess because culturally as well, I know in here in the UK, so we have like a national health service where people can, if they're struggling with something, they can go to their GP and refer themselves to that. Um, but then for somebody from an ethnic minority community or from a faith community, I think there are so many hurdles to even get to that point to seek support. But I know people do often look at things online. Um, I think that might even have been something that I did while I was going through my own stuff was um, to search online just about okay, how I'm feeling. 
um, and what that means and what I can do about it. That definitely seems like that's, you know, one of the only resources for, you know, many people who face, you know, that stigma around it's only, you know, how they can seek out online or how they can seek out through, you know, a, a source that doesn't necessarily have, have a stigma associated with it. And, you know, that was something that I wanted to speak about in terms of, you know, the culture that you're in, like, have you seen a different change within you know, being in the UK, and there are many resources out there, but, you know, from your culture, is there, a, you know, a large stigma attached around it? And is it even a topic that's being brought up or is even aware of? Or is it kind of something that's just placed in the back shelf that they, you know, don't really see as even an issue in society today? Yeah, I think, I think definitely, like, I would love to say that things have changed a lot over like the last 10 years but yeah I don't think that would that would that wouldn't be very honest because there's actually not much not much has shifted I mean I do see for example on social media and there are quite big movements about being more expressive and sharing your experiences and your stories and but in terms of like offline um I think the work is being done but it's it's quite slow but it's starting and it is there but I feel like because of that, the elements of risk. So where a large part of the culture are still in a kind of denial of emotional and psychological difficulties, it, it can be quite difficult to then take that step and put yourself in a vulnerable position where you kind of say, okay, I'm really struggling with this, or I, I have this going on and I need to seek help. Um, just because there's a lot of shame around and people will either feel like, oh my gosh, that means I've done something wrong, or it means I'm not strong enough in my faith, or it means that I don't know, my family will, like my family image and name will become a bit tarnished. Um, more people will look down on me. So there is still a lot of that around. Um, I think it's also difficult where there are kind of different generations within households and different generations within communities. So I feel like things are changing faster amongst younger generations. Um, but then, for example, parents or grandparents are still thinking in in maybe the kind of like how, how they're used to thinking about things and the kind of, you know, you just carry on, like, okay, you got nothing to be sad about. You just, you just get on with it. That, that definitely seems like a, a very similar, you know, approach to how other societies as well, you know, in, in the States, that seems like it's something as well in terms of gener generational, you know, thought patterns and, and the way that they perceive, you know, helping out, especially in terms of, you know, an issue such as mental health that, you know, people are are like being challenged at at a higher rate today and it's definitely something that we need to become more open and aware of have have you seen a change you know i'm not sure if you've specifically visited um you know pakistan and been back um to to that culture but you know is there a difference based on just location of you know is it just the resources available out there or is it just that, like you were saying, it's just that denial aspect of them not being open and aware to, to mental health? Yeah, I mean, I've been back a few, only like a handful of times. Um, I've been back about three times when I was younger and most recently I went this year actually. Um, but I don't really, I know there are a lot of resources out there. Or there, are, there are people doing like research and doing workshops and groups and um, writing sessions and doing a lot of psychoeducation and um, particularly with women um, because there are obviously like any society there are a lot of issues um, but where, where I'm from in Pakistan so I'm from a very like rural village area um, and then I guess on my last visit when I went there and I came back and I was sort of really grateful that actually I'm I'm a woman in this country and I've got the opportunities that I have and I've got the resources that I have because my life would have been completely different if I was there um, and I think, I guess maybe because it is the village, there, there, there is obviously within the village and the cities in Pakistan, there's a massive difference as well. Like the cities are just like the cities in the UK, um, but villages are quite a different story. Um, and gender roles are still quite traditional and there are a lot of like physical ailments. And I don't think there is really much acknowledgement of the importance of looking after your emotional and psychological aspects of yourself. Definitely. It, it seems like the, you know, location and, you know, what's around yourself 
plays a big part in terms of this because, you know, for, for most people, they can't seek out those resources and they don't even have the availability to, or they have to, you know, travel to a, to a severe length in order to, you know, seek out some of these helpful resources yeah. within you know, what you were going through at a young age and what you were experiencing before you were able to get this education, you know, what were you able to use or what were you able to lean on in terms of helping you through some of these challenges that you faced at a young age? Mm. Yeah. Um, I kind of wanted to just go back to the previous point as well and just quickly mention that I guess even before seeking resources and getting support, people need to have an awareness and have the vocabulary of mm. what's going on. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's not, it's not really at that point, um, especially where, where I went. Um, but yeah, coming back to my own experiences. So for me, I guess I had that element as well of not feeling safe enough or not feeling, I don't know, maybe I just didn't know, I didn't have the words or I didn't, I felt like I would be letting people down if I told them how I was feeling because it wasn't really anybody's fault. Um, there were a lot of things that contributed to when, when I was depressed and it, it lasted for about a year quite quite intense and quite severely um, but I think for me I I got into drawing and writing a lot at that time and again I, get, I think we can see that as like a another kind of safe avenue um, obviously it was just it was just me like it's not I, it wasn't therapeutic in terms of like um, working with somebody but for me it was really important to be able to express myself because I I bottled things up a lot and nobody would be able to tell really oh, that something's up. But I guess when it did get quite severe, then yeah, my parents could tell, my friends could tell as well. But at that point I was so isolated that it was very hard to have those um, communications and conversations with people either, either from me initiating them or from other people trying to get into my world a little bit. Like I was very shut off. Um, so I, I started to draw and I started to write. Um, and I even still keep journals actually, but my writing has changed like drastically. So back then it was kind of a creative outlet for me to express what I was feeling, to write down my thoughts. Um, when I think about it actually, it was very negative because that's the, that's the place that I was at. Um, but it was really helpful for me to see actually what's going on. Um, and I know with journaling, it does have benefits as well. In research, does show that it can be um, really helpful in helping you to become more self-aware and helping to helping you to gain clarity of like what's going on, um, allowing you to step back from your thoughts and emotions and just reflect a little bit and try and gain a different perspective. Um, and I did. I kept a lot of journals and I did a lot of drawing, and it was helpful. Um, but I think, yeah, for me, that was the one thing that I felt safe to go to. I mean, I did try and go to the GP afterwards as well, but there was such a long waiting list. And I, I think I was like, kind of like, oh, what's the point now? Because it, I had to wait such a long time. That's definitely one of the biggest challenges for you know many people today is obviously those wait times and that availability to actually speak with someone. And you know, you brought up the aspect of how people can do many other you know creative approaches to you know help cope with what they're struggling in, you know, the availability of what they have, because we need to learn ways to, you know, work with ourselves as we can, because we won't always have a therapist or a counselor to be there to assist us in, you know, our emotions and what we're going through. But, you know, to transition into, you know, now that you're able to assist people and help people manage and cope with their emotions, you know, can you speak about how impactful therapy can be for others and, you know, why we need to increase the amount of mental health professionals that we have within the field so we can reduce these wait times for someone, you know, like yourself, who's in their youth, who, or who was in their youth, that, that needs that support system while they're going through some of these issues? Yeah. Hey, I still, I, I think I still am in my youth, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> the best yeah. person. <laughs> um yeah so i guess with with therapy it's when people can get to that point where they can 
they can seek that support. Like it's so helpful to be able to have somebody that you can talk to um, that is not going to judge you, that's going to accept you, that's going to help you to reflect on what you're going through. Um, because I think a lot of the times with whether it's depression, anxiety or something else, it can feel very isolating. Um, and I think that's why when, when I do get clients, like even for them to come through the door and sit down is, is like a massive step because they've actually done something to change, to change the cycle that they were caught, that they were caught up in. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that therapy can help depending on what, what the issue is that somebody comes with. Um, so my work at the moment, so I, um, I work mainly from a cognitive behavior perspective. Um, but I use some elements of kind of psychodynamic and relational work. So where I might look at a person's like patterns in relationships or look at things that might have repeated from childhood um, or early, like very early experiences that they might be playing out in their current life. That's kind of creating and maintaining the current issue. Um, but some of that is more long-term work. But then with, with CBT, it can be used on quite a, like quite a short term as well. I've had clients that I've seen for maybe five, six weeks with like OCD and depression and by like the fifth week or the sixth week, they're feeling like, like they're a completely different person, um, which is really amazing. So with those things, I guess, um, CBT itself is quite direct as well. It's a lot more, um, a lot more hands-on. You have kind of tasks that you do in between sessions. Um, and some people like that. I guess the type of therapy does depend on the type of person you are as well. Some things might not suit you. Um, but other things might work really well. So with people that, I guess I, CBT, they do find it like a big bit because they have something tangible. They have like worksheets that they can take away with them and things that they can practice. Um, and it really helps a person to become aware of their unhelpful thought patterns or unhelpful behavior patterns. So we first start like by making people aware of, okay, what, what are you doing that's contributing to the issue? Um, because there is always something that we're doing and we can only change what we're in control of. And as much as we like to blame other people or to feel like, I guess we can feel quite helpless and quite hopeless when we're, when we're depressed, when we're anxious. And um, therapy is a really, really good way of helping you to regain that empowerment and taking back responsibility and control um, and noticing that, oh, actually, wait, I can change this thought or I can change this behavior and seeing what happens when you do that because we often get stuck in certain ways and those ways are not always helpful. So something needs to change and you kind of try out different thoughts, you try out different behaviors. And a lot of the times, well, majority, like majority of the time, you will realize something about yourself. That, oh, I can't believe I always used to have this thought. I can't believe I, I'm so critical of myself. Um, that's quite a big one. I find a lot of people start to realize that that inner voice has become so loud that they didn't, they didn't even realize that they were criticizing themselves all the time or that their negative inner voice was kind of, was there sort of every single day, like every hour of the day. And when they're aware of things like that, then, then you're able to, then you're able to change it and address it. I, I think that's one of the most fascinating things, you know, you, you brought up that you can have, you know, an experience in your childhood and it can curate into a repetitive, you know, behavior or emotional coping mechanism, you know, throughout 10, 15, 20 years down in your life. And that's something that therapy can help you become aware of and understand, you know, this is something that I've been doing for 10 plus years. And it's not something that I've even, even become aware of or understood that it's, you know, changed my relationships or changed, you know, how I perceive myself, which therapy offers such a great, you know, ability to become aware of these, you know, different patterns within yourself. And, you know, can you explain more about how you work with someone to, you know, become aware of these patterns and how, you know, that can change the course of, you know, their emotions and their thought patterns throughout their day? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess we do exercises that they have to, if they're experiencing something that's quite difficult or that they're struggling with, they, they stop in that moment and go through the, the awareness of, okay, what, what am I feeling? What am I thinking? Where is it in my body? That type of thing. So they, they really start to notice and become conscious of the, the automatic things that would be happening to them usually. 
So rather than everything operating on an unconscious, like a reactive level, um, they then start to tune into and start to become more conscious. And instead of reacting to things, they, with that awareness and the consciousness, they can then choose a different response. And that, that's, I guess, the kind of most empowering thing from it. So like, for example, if somebody is thinking something of themselves, like, okay, there's, there's something wrong with me, I'm, I'm a failure, I'm a problem, and they have this kind of narrative going on inside them, and they notice that, okay, this, I keep getting this reoccurring thought, and they notice that, then they can begin to change that. Um, I noticed even, even like with, with my own patterns, I remember from, because I was somebody that I used to bottle things up a lot, um, I guess to do with, because of either my personality or, um, feeling that maybe my parents were not really emotionally available at that time, um, then my own kind of thought patterns were that, okay, I, I need to rely on myself or there's nobody, like it's not, I'm not important enough to be heard and things like that. So those things have obviously now, now changed and I am able to be more expressive and like I can, I can notice that actually, yeah, people do care or I am important, whereas like, 10 years ago, that was sort of like, oh, actually, no, it's just don't say anything. And people do have a lot of narratives about themselves and everyone will be different. Everyone will have something different going on for them. Um, but for example, if somebody is thinking, oh, I can't cope. And every time something happens that they feel a bit overwhelmed by, they go into automatically, oh, I can't cope, I can't cope. And then they start to panic. But if they're to, to shift that into, okay, actually, let's look at the things that you've coped with in the past because all of us have coped with so many, like so much stuff in our lives, but we sometimes forget that. So we, we would then look at, okay, what well, you have coped with all of these things. So what does that tell you about yourself? And then they kind of realize, oh, actually, wait, yeah, I can do it. Um, and then I guess then it changes how they even approach problems and how they, how they approach how they approach the kind of difficulties that are going on for them it's rather than thinking, oh my gosh, I can't cope with this and start to panic and actually, no way, I, I can cope. And then they find that things get easier. Obviously, that's just kind of one example, kind of surface level, but yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's truly remarkable how, you know, it takes this time to become aware and understand, you know, especially the interpersonal relationship that you have within yourself. And, you know, you brought up the ideas that some people think, you know, they're worthless. And these are a lot of, you know, recurring thoughts that people who struggle from a mental health challenge have. And, you know, they constantly think that they, they can't cope or they can't help themselves. They won't be able to change the way that they're thinking. But can you speak about how impactful and how therapy can change the perspective of someone viewing themselves and, you know, how this, how therapy can change the relationships that they have, their views within themselves, but as well, you know, how that dividing line of speaking with someone else changes their course of all of their relationships and how they connect and communicate with other people. Yeah, I think it's, I think that's like, it's really important what you mentioned about how that, re having that relationship with ourselves, because essentially that is a relationship itself like how we relate to us and what's going on with us emotionally and psychologically. Um, I mean, there are a lot of parts within ourselves that can become frag fragmented, but just, to, just like we have relationships outside, we also have a relationship with ourselves. And when that relationship with ourselves is not great, it will translate to the relationships around us. So for example, if we're, if we're feeling ashamed or we're, we're blaming ourselves for something, um, or we're thinking that we're not we're not good enough. Um, we might then keep people at arm's length because we're we're feeling ashamed of ourselves, and we then might project that onto other people and feel like oh they're gonna they're gonna think something bad of me, or they're gonna blame something, they're gonna blame me for something, and then it affects the relationship. But if we're in a place where we can start to accept ourselves or start to actually be less judgmental with ourselves and show ourselves a bit of kindness, a bit of generosity and a bit of care. Um, that relationship with ourselves then becomes a lot more enjoyable and a lot more content. And then that will impact the relationships that we have around us as well. Um, I think 
when we start to notice, or like, for example, the good things that we're doing, and that can feed into developing a good, good self-esteem and noticing that, oh, actually, yeah, I did these things well, or I was able to do that today, or somebody said this nice thing about me today, and paying attention to those things rather than the things that we assume go wrong, or rather than, I guess it's kind of like changing your, changing your radar a little bit, so you're not, you're not scanning for negative things, so you're not scanning for evidence that um, supports your negative self-beliefs, because you see those have come from past experiences that are not happening right now. But being able to look at actually in developing good beliefs about myself, there must be evidence to support that. And when we can notice the good things that are happening around us, it helps us to feel more confident in ourselves. Um, but then we're also more at ease with, with others um, around us as well. Um, I know you mentioned something about the childhood. Um, was that part of your question? I don't know if you wanted to go back to that. Yeah, this is actually something that I think would be would be great to speak about is, you know, just in terms of, um, you know, childhood and what um, people really are, are experiencing, whether it's, you know, thoughts and emotions, or, you know, some of the cha these challenges that come into place, you know, for um, someone who's experiencing that, you know, what, what could be the um, impact of, you know, just having someone to communicate with and, and seek out um, a resource in order to, you know, just change their belief system, like you're saying, from a negative to a positive. Because really, that's, that's one of the biggest divide, dividing lines is, you know, having a, a negative, you know, thought patterns of, of thinking that they're worthless, or just thinking that their previous experience was bad. So, you know, how can, whether it's, you know, through th therapy or through, you know, uh, something such as like CBT or something going into, into the past, you know, how can someone change their past experience to, you know, view it as a, a learning experience rather than having it as, you know, this, this past experience that brought trauma and brought harm within their life? Yeah, I think that's really about the reframing. So what you mentioned about like seeing that past experience in a different light. So I guess with, with the past, obviously we can't change what's happened already, but usually when things, I guess if they're kind of negative experiences or traumatic experiences, they will kind of stay with us um, probably unconsciously as well. And I think a lot of the time, I know there's probably been a lot of research on this in terms of like the things that, happened to us in early childhood usually we we will repeat those through our like adolescence and adult life um even without knowing because it's kind of like um it's kind of like a i guess a software or something that's running on a computer and it's it's been programmed from that age and that's what's keep, that's what keeps playing through our life um but then it gets to a point where it's not helpful anymore it becomes outdated or it might have served us for the things that we were going through in childhood but now our life is different we're different we've developed we've grown we've got different relationships we might be living in a different city and obviously we're we're growing into adults so we need to make sure that that script that's playing for us in our life is not one that's come from childhood um particularly if it's a if it's a negative one or if it's kind of um if it's proving to be unhelpful then being able to notice that okay actually this experience happened to me when I was younger and since then I've always thought this about myself and actually when I think that about myself it makes me it makes me go back to when I was when I was a kid um, and I think that can often really not exactly stop people but it make, make it harder for people to kind of move forward um, and that's really where for example in CBT therapy then you kind of um, shifting some of those thoughts and beliefs and creating new ones because I guess we can have as much awareness as as we can get but then what do you do with that <laughs> because I, I, I even remember getting to a point where like okay I was I was depressed and I was aware of these patterns within my family and within myself and I, I was just kind of I guess they say like analysis paralysis isn't it and I was just so aware of things and I just I just didn't know what to do with that awareness but even something like that, then going to therapy, obviously your therapist is a trained professional, obviously therapists, different therapists will work in different ways. 
Um, but then they can help you use that awareness and to facilitate, to facilitate growth or, okay, actually you're aware of this, what can we do differently? Um, and I think therapy is really important in that respect and giving you the tools and providing you with different strategies because we've gone through our lives doing what we do in the way that we know and we can't know everything. There's always something out there that, that is new to us. Um, so going to therapy and speaking to a trained professional, they can give you new things that you maybe haven't considered before or even challenge you in ways that you haven't thought of or um, question things that you've taken as facts for like years and years and actually make you think about things that, that you hold as, as part of your reality. Um, and when those things, when you can kind of start to deconstruct those things and while at the same time learning new things, or learning new tools, um, creating new beliefs, creating new thoughts, um, then that, that's what really kind of pushes you forward or helps you to, to keep developing and moving away from old, old patterns and kind of conditioned responses into more conscious, um, more conscious patterns. For many people who experience some of these mental health challenges and issues, a lot of it is displaced within, you know, their early years within whether it's their childhood or when they're becoming a young adult. And it's something that either, you know, like you said, they often don't remember and it's unconsciously brought within their reality, or it just might be experiences that they don't have a, a full, uh, you know, knowledge or awareness of. But for yourself, and what you faced, you know, what were some of the biggest lessons that you were able to uncover, you know, as you face many of the issues that you now are very educated and very aware of? And now that you're assisting others, you know, what was one big lesson that you learned through what you were able to experience as, uh, you know, someone in your youth? Hmm, that's a good question. I think one of the biggest things for me um, was about taking responsibility for my own emotions. Um, and it, it sounds like a simple thing, but it's something, I guess, particularly from a cultural perspective as well, where um, our, the family setups are quite, it's, it's quite a collective society with collectivist values and everybody, I guess, I don't know if you've heard the, word, the term enmeshment, where there are not really boundaries between people and parents, I guess, particularly if they've not been brought up in this country, obviously they're gonna come from, from their own countries with their own kind of way of doing things and their own ways of relating and thinking. And those things then get passed down through the generation. So like for me, I don't know, maybe it was cultural stuff or maybe it was because my parents were unwell or um, there was mental health in the family. Like I felt like I needed to be the one to fix things. And even as a child, I felt like, oh, I need to, I need to make sure like mum's okay, or I need to make sure that nothing goes wrong or that things don't upset people or um, needing to look after a parent rather than the parent looking after the child. So it's that kind of parentification um, that I guess, yeah, I was thinking about it now, that was probably there even like way before when I experienced my own depression in my late teens, but um, I guess it was probably an accumulation of experiences that led to that. But then for me to kind of now, I really, I really do value being able to look after my emotional needs and my psychological needs. Um, I'm a lot more aware and a lot more, a lot more expressive and a lot more assertive in terms of allowing myself and other people to know what I need. Um, it's not always easy. I mean, there are, there are some things that I still might not share, but I know that it's enough for me to acknowledge it and to allow it for myself as well. So giving myself the kind of permission to feel sad when I'm feeling, when I'm feeling sad and, and not to, not to bury it or not to kind of suppress it. Um, but also taking the time out for myself to look after me. So if I feel like oh my gosh, I've been really busy and that busyness is kind of creating a bit of anxiety or it's kind of, um, making me feel a bit overwhelmed and 
and I know that for me is like, okay, now I need to switch off for a bit. Okay, now I need to just kind of clear my schedule and, and have some downtime. Um, whereas like years ago, I had no idea what I needed. Like I didn't know what I was experiencing. So beyond being able to like name my emotions and to know what I need and to give myself that, that space and time. And like, I know when I'm in a good place, it does affect my relationships. So when I'm struggling with something, it will affect relationships. Maybe, I guess, because I do still often like wear a mask with things and I will still go back into that bottling things up or, but it doesn't happen as often. And um, I'm married, so my partner as well with, with um, our communication, it has improved a lot because I have, at least with him, I know, okay, actually, that's, this is the relationship that it affects the most. So if I'm struggling and I'm not okay with something, I at least let him know because at least he knows what's going on for me. Otherwise, I would just go back into isolating myself and shutting myself off. And I know from previous experience that that's not um, a healthy way to sort of manage things. Um, yeah, I guess there's probably a, a few points in there. But yeah, I think if, if we can take the time to learn about ourselves, um, it just, it makes things a lot more manageable and allows us to, yeah, to enjoy things and to grow. And if we can look after ourselves, we're also, we're, we're stopping that negativity from passing on, I guess. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that. I, I think many of the audience can relate to that because often that is something that we lose sight of is, you know, taking care of ourselves and whether that's through taking care of or being considerate to other people first before ourselves, or whether it's just having that, that lack of care or, you know, understanding of our emotions as we go through it to, you know, like you say, to, to mask it or to, you know, withhold the emotions that we're playing. And I think that's something that, you know, many people struggle with today and, I definitely think that's a valuable, you know, topic to to speak about and bring about um, within the audience because many people need to, you know, continue to learn about managing and coping with their emotions, especially within our youth. Because as a child, you know, people can experience some of these challenges and they don't necessarily know how to, you know, release their emotions and speak about them and to, you know, learn different coping mechanisms that aren't harmful to themselves or other people yeah. to I think no sorry yeah I was just gonna say about that kind of safety especially as a young person as well like it there is really important I mean I know I touched on it before as well where I kind of felt like the writing and drawing and having mm -hmm. that avenue was something that was safe like a safe outlet for me and now like the more I've learned about things and I'm able to express things better as I've gotten older now I am able to use a couple of really safe and trusting relationships to share these things. So again, it's kind of feeling safe enough to express. And I think it is really important to have something that allows you to express things in a safe way, whatever that is, and it will look different for different people. Definitely. It, it, it's all about finding, finding out whatever, whatever your outlet can be, whether it's, you know, a creativity, whether it's exercise, there's many different ways, but finding that is definitely you know, first and foremost for people and especially youth because they need to let out a lot of the energy, a lot of the emotions that they feel throughout, you know, their experiences and finding that the right way to do that that's not harmful is, is definitely so important for our youth. To really, you know, wrap up what you've experienced and what really your insight brings within your own life I, I love to ask this question to to wrap up my episode with my guests to give a glimpse into you know what was a true and profound moment within your life. So I want to have you you know imagine that you're writing a book throughout all of your experiences and all of your insights that you've gained throughout your life thus far, and I want you to give us a glimpse into one chapter and. That can be an experience, it can be a lesson, or it can be, you know, something that was just a profound moment within your life. And tell us a little bit why as to, you know, why that was so impactful for yourself, whether it was a big moment within your own mental health, or whether it was just a moment 
that really changed the course of how you, you know, perceived yourself and how you lived your life today? Yeah, I think, I think there's probably been quite a few little moments, but I was, I guess, thinking or talking about the things I experienced um, when, when I was feeling depressed. I remember, obviously, like I mentioned, I'm Muslim, so my faith also plays quite a role in how, like, my day-to-day -day life, basically, from, from how I dress to, like, my kind of prayers and things like that, but also in terms of um, how I cope as well. So when I was feeling really down and depressed, I was quite, I guess, it was difficult for me to maintain the kind of practical elements of, of the religion. Um, but I remember when, yeah, it was one night, this was when I was feeling like it, my depression was really quite severe and I would be crying constantly and like I would, yeah, I would just feel really like isolated, really withdrawn and disconnected from everybody. And um, I'm quite um, I'm quite a visual person and I've always had lots of dreams throughout my life and recently as well and they're always quite vivid and I remember this one particular one that um so basically you know in my in my old house um we have a basement next to the living room so there's a, there's a door um connected to the living room that goes down into the basement and obviously basements are a little bit of a scary thing when you're a child so in in my dream there was something that was pulling me towards the basement and it was it was like a really dark like, shadow that was pulling me and I was kind of clinging on to the dining table and um, my sister was there and she, so our holy book is the Quran and she kind of gave that to me and there was a verse that kind of jumped out and I remember waking up and I had like, I had the numbers in my head. It was like, oh, 26, 26, 62 or something. And then I was in my room, I found the, it was like an English translation because I don't understand the Arabic, but it was an English translation of the Quran and I, um, I opened it to those numbers and that verse like has always stayed with me. So it was, it was from, um, I think that that chapter was talking about when Pharaoh in Egypt and when Moses was there and had the kind of commands from God and that particular verse, that 2662 that I opened it to, um, it was when Moses said he was quite defiant and he said, Oh no, like indeed my Lord is with me and he will guide me. And that for me was like, I was just like, whoa, like what just happened? <laughs> like that for me really gave me a lot of comfort actually in that even though I'm feeling so down and I'm feeling so isolated and I feel like I'm being swallowed up by all this darkness, like I'm actually not on my own and that, that God is with me. And it was really a reminder for me to kind of keep my faith and to know that actually this will come to an end. Um, or that there will be some kind of way out of this because, because God is with me. Um, and that's really always, it's always stuck with me. And my faith has been an important, like an important um, aspect of, of my whole journey. So um, I think that for me was a really kind of standout experience from when I was feeling really, really down. Um, and there is something, there are different, different elements of faith that I, I guess I've kind of, um, it kind of fluctuates sometimes, but it's, it's always there. And for somebody that's experiencing kind of isolation or is feeling alone um, and feeling like, oh, nobody really understands what I'm going through. Like as a person of faith, just having that belief that actually, you know, God is with me, even though things are, things are not great and things are really difficult, like I'm, I'm not alone. And it's always a reminder for me that just to keep, to keep trust in something bigger than myself. Thank you for sharing that. It definitely it offers, you know, that sense of courage and hope and belief that, you know, you, you have the ability to move forward and you have someone there to, you know, comfort and support you, which oftentimes for, you know, many people who are struggling with a mental health issue, that's, you know, one big profound step to have and one big, you know, moment to, to feel secure and, not that you need to, you know, harm yourself or be in a place of discomfort and loneliness. So that's so awesome that you were able to find that. And, you know, that gave you that sense of comfort and awareness that, that you were not alone and you, you never will be. So, you know, thank you for that. And, you know, thank you for taking this time to, to be here as the 35th guest on the Mental Insights podcast. It, it was such a pleasure to learn about the work that you do and some of the insights and experiences that you've had within the mental health field 
to share with my audience and bring up this important conversation about mental health and what we can do to move forward in, in such an important field today. No, thank you. Thank you for giving me um, a space on your platform as well to be part of the podcast and share some of my experiences. I hope, I hope they are helpful to some of the people that listen. So thank you. It was my pleasure to have you on, Nadia. I, I truly appreciate it.